get beaten too badly. Uh, or get away if you can. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. Uh, um, the main thing that uh, I think from our point of view is defense attorneys that we'd like to talk about. I'm, I'm sorry this is in the way. Uh, I can try to see everybody. Is, uh, you know, a lot of people, when you have pending cases or investigations with the government or, or law enforcement in general, or law enforcement always wants to interview the client or interview somebody. And the client usually, most of the time, not always, most of the time will say things that help the government or law enforcement make the case against them or some case against them that they didn't already have. Can anybody think of maybe two well-known, prominent names that have been in the news, maybe lately or the recent past, where people got charged after talking with the government, maybe with something else like lying to the government? Does anybody think of a name? Is it general, formerly on uh, President Trump's staff? He was under, uh, there was an investigation about Russia Gate, and now he got charged with lying to investigate. If he hadn't said anything, he would he have not been charged at all? And then there was a very famous person, uh, I, I don't know if I want to say any names anymore, but uh, she was charged with Martha lying Stewart. to the government. You say Martha. Can we say Martha Stewart? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, a t that's, that what, that's what always comes to my mind when the government wants to talk to, well, we're the government, we're here to help you. And I say, but Martha Stewart. And they say, but, but, I said, yeah, but Martha Stewart. So I, you know, sometimes talking to the government can, it can help the case in, very, in narrow circumstances, but most of the time the rule should be if the government wants to talk to your client, don't. Anything else is the exception. And you got to think very carefully about that. Um, You know, um, if, uh, well, let me point this out. The penalty for talking, it's uh, th Section 18 U.S. Code 1001, statements or entries generally. It's a five-year felony or $250,000 fine, eight years if it relates to domestic terrorism for lying to the government. Uh, there's a state law counterpart, by the way, it's... Uh, I don't remember the statute, but the statute says if the underlying uh, offense that, that's being lied about is a felony, then the false statements or false reports is a felony. If it's concerning a misdemeanor, then it's a misdemeanor. Of course, they can always do a lesser included. Um, I guess if you are going to talk, let your client talk to the government, or before you even consider that, you want to try to know as much as you can about your case or the client's matter from the client. Try to find out as much as you can. Remember, they're, they're not always very forthcoming. And, you know, they tell you everything. Is that everything? Yeah, that's everything. But then there's, oh, there's something else they didn't tell you. And, the, and the, they never fail to surprise you with, with things that they didn't remember or didn't tell you or didn't think was important or you just didn't know. Um, you might want to try to get as much discovery as you can from the government. Um, here's where it kind of helps if, if everybody knows everybody. Uh, for example, let's say you know the investigators involved, maybe there's a U.S. attorney involved and you know him. And It's hard to get the U.S. attorney to talk about a case that he can't admit exists. He says, well, you know I can't, I can't even discuss it, I can't admit that we even have a case. So they're not going to put that in writing, but, you know, oh, yeah, you want to have a meeting. In a meeting, you might have, you know, a little informal chatter. But, uh, you know, if you ask, they might give you some information. They might give you copies of reports. Just try to get as much information as you can about the case. Um, try, to, uh, try to get a proper letter, because if you get a proper letter, um, at least if you let your client talk and he tells the truth or she, uh, the statements that they make can't be used against him in, in bringing an initial case, uh, you know, in that regard. Of course, they charge him with lying or 
impeach him later, but that's another story. Um, if your client's sitting down for an interview, well, make sure he knows not to speculate about things he doesn't know. If you, you know, you're standing there and he says, well, if you don't know, you don't have to speculate. Well, if he doesn't know, the answer should be, I don't know that. You know, don't, don't start elaborating. Well, I suppose it probably happened when uh, this got brought over by such and such, you know, whatever the circumstances are. They don't need to know. The question was, do you know how this happened to come here? No, I don't. If you don't know, you don't know. The answer is no, I do, I do not know that. Sorry. Um, some cases the government is not going to prosecute. Some cases maybe they shouldn't be. Maybe, maybe there's technically grounds, but maybe there's a lot of other circumstances like, you know, the client really didn't set out to commit a crime. This fell into some circumstances. I've got some cases, but one of them is kind of a live case, and it's kind of on the, on the back end. It's about to fall off the edge of the earth, but I don't want to talk about it because it's, it's a live case. But I will talk about a state case that I had um, where talking maybe helped uh, when I was a detective on James Island during the Hurricane Hugo recovery era. Uh, we had a call for a burglary that had occurred earlier, and the, apparently the burglar had returned to the house and was there now. So I was in the office, which was a block or two away. I rode over there with my lieutenant, and uh, we got there. There was the person meeting the description of the burglar at the house, waving at the police, going back to what he was doing, pulling stuff off the house, and a uh, description of the Lincoln Continental sitting in the front yard with a middle-aged lady holding a dog in her lap while the burglar was over there burglarizing the house and uh, just sitting there. And my lieutenant said, there he is, Henry. There he is. Go arrest him. I said, lieutenant, this just doesn't look right. Something, something doesn't feel right about this. Yes, I know it's a burglary. Yes, I know that they meet the description, and it's probably the same guy, but it just doesn't feel right. So I walked over, and I talked to him, and uh, it turns out he was a contractor, and there was a lot of contractors. Probably everybody remembers the roofers the most, but uh, there was a lot of contractors, and he, uh, this contractor had gotten a job to go strip a house that, that was beyond repair. Well, he got the wrong house. Basically, he made $100,000, $200,000 a year on his job. He was a very good contractor. But he just had one minor impediment. He never learned to read or write. You know, it's rare now, but, but it, it's out there. There's a lot of people out there. They, they may come up and they say, I, excuse me, I don't have my spectacles. Can you read this to me, yeah, it may be something, but there's a lot of people out here who can't read or write. And he couldn't read or write, and when he got his directions over the phone, well, he was trying to write directions, but he couldn't write. So he wrote, you know, the best he could. Then he couldn't read the directions that he wrote, because he couldn't read. So he got the wrong house. And how do I know all this? Because he talked to us. We asked him, I asked him to come to the station, and. Uh, and tell me his story. You know, I just I, I didn't arrest him. I let him ride it, ride in the car with me, but I didn't arrest him. I had his wife drive his car, and uh, he made this long story. And I, we wrote it down. I had a junior detective over there, and I said, "Okay, I just need you to sign your statement." But I can't sign my name, <laughs> and I can't read the statement. So we had a little blockage there. Then, make a long story longer. Somebody showed up. I'm, I'm not going to mention who it was. Everybody probably would know the name. Uh, but he showed up and he says, oh. barged into the office, came through the front, into the back, where we were talking with the client. He said, I'm so-and-so. I'm, -so. I'm his lawyer. I demand I, I to speak to my client. And uh, I, uh, I invited him to walk back out front, because he had kind of passed the line there. And I, I won't go into great detail about that, but it was uh, pretty short and swift, and he went back outside, and then we got it all squared away. But uh, the bottom line was I could not bring myself to arrest that man because I did not believe he was guilty. But the only way I would have known that 
for sure was if he told me his side of the story. And uh, his lawyer was understandably concerned that, well, what's he telling? You know, he didn't know everything. His, probably the wife had called the lawyer. But, uh, sometimes it's, it's not <coughs> wrong to let the client talk to law enforcement or the government. Sometimes it helps, but you got to consider that very carefully. That's, that's the exception to the rule, or that should be the exception, because most of the time, you know, they're going to surprise you, they're going to not tell you everything, or they're going to help make a case, or, you know, if they make a misstatement about something and the government thinks they're guilty, they might find something else to charge them with. So there's a great risk there. I think everybody knows that. Um, Miller, you want to add anything? Would you want me to? All right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I want Miller add some stuff. Heard enough of me. <laughs> Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. I, I have a, 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 a few comments to make, and uh, Mark Kelly is here, so I, I defer the expertise on ATF to him. Uh, I, uh, for the most part, uh, I have found that, uh, that handling gun cases with prosecutors and, and law enforcement is not that much different than other cases, uh, with a couple of exceptions, uh, especially when, when you're dealing with the federal government. The, the state is just an entirely different ballgame. They don't have guidelines. They don't have the kind of professionals that the federal government has, and, and usually serious, serious gun cases end up in the U.S. Attorney's Office anyway uh, because of the expertise the ATF has and other such people. Uh, you know, if you're dealing with a case, you have a felon in possession. Drug is not contraband, but in that case, it's just like drugs. The gun itself may be perfectly legal. It's your client's status that prevents him from possessing it. So in a case like that, it's really no different than a drug case or any other possession case. If your client possesses that gun, he or she is in trouble. And about the only way to defend against that kind of thing is, you know, a Fourth Amendment. How did they get it? That's the only real legal defense that you have. Uh, if they search the car or search the house improperly and got it, then you have just like drug. You have a defense. If not, and they, that, that person possessed it, they are in trouble. Then you're talking about some kind of plea. In some kind of sentencing, that, that's just practically where you are. Uh, so, so uh, again, solicitor's office, and I'm not, I'm not putting them down. I worked in the solicitor's office. My wife is assistant solicitor. I have great respect for them. I just think that that's different. It depends on where you are, what agency, and what solicitor's office in terms of what kind of plea bargain and negotiation might work. And I don't think gun cases are different. Again, to my experience, in most serious gun cases end up. In, in federal court uh, or, or with the ATF involvement or something of that nature. Let's talk a bit about the, the unique things about federal court because it is different, in my opinion. It, it really is. Uh, fortunately and genuinely, in, in my experience in, in here, it, it may not be that way everywhere. We know there are bad prosecutors. Uh, we know there are bad uh, law enforcement uh, personnel. We know there are bad defense attorneys uh, and lawyers. That's very clear. Uh, but fortunately, in, in my experience here in South Carolina, uh, when you deal with the federal government, you are dealing with people who are ethical, who have integrity, uh, and they're more professional. And uh, they, they tend to be very honest, and I, I have been able to trust them. Uh, and, and so, um, it, however, trust has nothing to do with confusing uh, trust in them being people of integrity versus doing their job. They're going to do their job. And if they find evidence, you know, that your client is violating the law, then they're going to prosecute you. Uh, so, you know, how do you deal with this? And like I said, a, a simple felon in possession to me is not a classic gun case. That's more like a drug case, but it's because of your client's status. What if the gun is itself an issue? Your client has automatic weapons. They've altered them. They've done things to them. They've transported them illegally into the country or across state lines. And you really have what I consider a true gun case it's about the gun, the kind of firearm it is, and whether uh, it, it is illegal in and of itself. Uh, your first issue in any case like this, and I, especially if you're new to this, and you ought to know this anyway, but I find a lot of defense attorneys in careful negotiations are unaware of this source. Uh, it, it would behoove you to take some time, if you do any federal cases, uh, to go to the Department of Justice website and look at something called the United States Attorney's Manual the USAM. It's there. Uh, if it's in the U.S. Attorney's Office, it's about nine volumes and it's thick, about four inches, because I, 
I was introduced to it when I became a U.S. attorney. And it regulates everything about U.S. attorneys, how they should dress, what kind of locks should be on their doors, what kind of desks they should have. You're not interested in all that nonsense. But all the bureaucratic supervision is there, and there is page after page after page of what a U.S. attorney is supposed to consider in bringing a prosecution, what they're supposed to consider in plea negotiations, and it's kind of nice to inform yourselves of that, just can a lot of U.S. attorneys don't read it. Uh, now, it, it, it does not give you the basis to challenge a charge or to suppress something if they're doing something wrong. And I'm not telling you to file an ethics complaint and go to OPR, although you should be aware of it. Where, where they're playing a hard game and you are, uh, this is, you know, it's something to remind them about. But in negotiating with these people, it is at least important if you, if you want to make a rational argument and you're trying to make an effort, there are detailed guidelines from the Department of Justice across the board in every case. And sometimes in specific cases, about how to deal cases, how to plead cases, what the brain charges, and I'm not just talking about two or three pages. There's a lot of policy there. Most defense attorneys just don't know anything about it, and quite frankly, U.S. attorneys do know something about it. Most of them, they're told about it at least within the first week on the job in the training, but a lot of them kind of forget that. They never turn to the U.S. AM again unless they are unfortunate enough to get in trouble with OPR, the Office of Professional Responsibility, uh, with DOJ. But you need to know it. Because it's one thing to play a hard game with you in Fourth Amendment and prosecution, but and judges can't dismiss cases. They're not supposed to. They're not based on agency regulations. But in, within the U.S. Attorney's Office, within the federal government, OPR is real. It's not just a sham internal investigation. It's real. They have teeth, and AUSAs know it. And they constantly have training where people from OPR come and remind them about those guidelines. And they're watching. So, you know, as you couch your arguments and make your motions, it's not unhelpful to reference that in a footnote or in a letter. If you really have a problem, you have a concern. It can irritate something. That, that's, when, that's when things get difficult. But you should know, you know, when you go to the U.S. attorney, you want to make a rational argument, you have a basis. You, they can't ignore that. They may act like they are but they can't ignore that. Uh, aside from that, which most people don't know about, uh, I, would, I would say this to you when dealing uh, quickly with the federal government. I'm talking about what I consider a true gun case. Okay, that is, it's about the firearm and whether it's legal in and of itself. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we all know something about guns. From us, most of us in here love guns, or I guess, or we probably wouldn't be here. And I'm guessing most people are gun, gun owners, most people have a CNC. And, and that's fine, and you may hunt or shoot or, or do whatever you do. Uh, do not presume that you're the expert. Be very careful about this, because you, you, you may know, most of you probably, all of you know more about firearms than I do. But if you have a client to cash your firearms that's inherited some or come into some from a family member, you need to get an expert to look at those firearms. And I'm not trying to get him a job, but a former ATF agent. Yeah, no, a former ATF agent is a great thing to get. Uh, and, and uh, or somebody knows something about it that could actually be an expert in federal court at a trial to testify. You need to find out about that gun really your, yourself. And uh, you know some things you know if the barrel's too short, you know some changes are made. But you need to have somebody look at it uh, and be sure uh, that you know what it is precisely and why it's illegal and what all is wrong with it, because that's what it's going to come down to in what I call a real gun case. And, and, uh, and, and the ATF, I have found, and I'm sure it's different across the country, but it is, is quite professional about this. They, they, there are a lot of people, the NRA, there are a lot of gun groups watching them. Uh, I'm sure in ways they don't like them. This is a hot issue. And, and so they want to be right. And my experience is generally they need to be right. They're very professional. And, and, and thus far, I have, you know, we, we all understand it's an objective issue. It's an expert issue as to whether a gun is fully automatic or the barrels to control or other things have been done to it. But sometimes it's just obvious. Uh, in terms of dealing with agents and stuff, I have found that, as Henry indicated, once you know your case, and I'm going to stop turn over to, to Mark because we look run out of time, but I cannot emphasize that knowing your case, I, I really can't. Look, clients do not tell us the whole truth. They don't tell us the whole truth for different reasons. One, they lie. That's who they are, especially if they're criminals, they lie. The other thing is they just don't think some things are important. They don't get it. It's not lying. They don't get it. 
but you've got to drill them. You've got to find out what they've got. In the course of doing this, don't you don't have them bring the guns into your office. Uh, uh, get pictures. Everybody has an iPhone. Don't don't be. You know they all show up one day with guns. That, that's just not good. Uh, have them take pictures of it and come to your office and show you and tell you where it is, or tell them to go take pictures of it. You may not even want to ask them, I'm talking strictly from a defense attorney, where it is. But just go get me a picture and bring it from good angles. And so you can look at it and show, maybe show your expert before you get too much into it. Uh, but but uh, I have found when the time comes, I have found you're going to find out quickly. And we'll pass this uh, baton. You've got to find out quickly, and this is any federal case, is your client guilty? Are they, number one? And two, can the government prove it? You've got to find that out quick. Because you have to cooperate. And this is what I get to the other big thing about the feds. It's the guidelines. It's, the, it's not the law. The heck with the substantive law. The guidelines is, are the, is the tail that wags the dog in federal court. We know that. It's all about what you're going to get and how much they can manipulate that. So you've got to find out how the guidelines apply on each firearm, on each change to it, and how big of a hit you're looking at and what the government can prove. And honestly... King Kong may not be on your doorstep, but you, you, you can't fight the feds. And if King Kong is coming down the road, you need to go to King Kong first and, and ask for mercy and say, this is, and say, we have an issue, we have a problem, what can you do for me? And figure out if, if they, and I, I have found that when you do that, they, they will generally tell you, uh, at least to some degree, what they know about your client and you try to get you know, as much information as you can and, and be prepared to try to talk to them. Well, what if, I have this client, he does, he or she does X, Y, and Z. You know, what, what, what are we talking about? And generally speaking, U.S. attorneys, ATF agents have a lot of cases. They'd rather not have a bunch of trials. They'd rather not do indictments. Uh, and if, if, if you can get off the case, like if your client has inherited guns or come into them innocently, they don't want to prosecute you. But if you've shipped them into the country, across state lines, if you've bought them, if you've changed them, and if you see that, Eventually, King Kong is coming to your doorstep. You need to go to King Kong before King Kong comes to you uh, uh, and, and, and try to work something out up front. And you generally will get something more favorable. And uh, I have found that in, when you go to the government, one last thing, these guys, not just stands because of Mark, I work with Mark on plenty of cases, that you, you might can buffalo a, a detective at a sheriff's department, a police department. You're not going to do that long with the feds. And if you try to lie to them and try to hide stuff from them, they generally, one, are going to find it out. And number two, they probably already know it anyway. So if you're guilty, honesty is the best policy. And that's how you need to convince your client to proceed. And don't do anything without a profit letter. This thing work. Uh -huh. you all hear this? Yeah. All right, I'll just stand up here behind the, these microphones. Um, is that okay? Miller and Henry have set me up for perfect little ending and the reason i'm looking at my phone is because that's where the clock is we don't have a clock in the back of the room if we were in a good classroom we could keep an eye on the clock because one of the most important things i don't want to do is waste anybody's time or run into other speakers times but um, miller gave me a great launching pad for the reality check on federal firearms cases he said real gun cases a real a real atf gun case is very rare very rarely does ATF have the ability to work a really good importation case or a conversion case where somebody's converting machine guns. Or um, one of the things I used to do in the U.S. Attorney's Office here in, in Charles's work, interstate firearms trafficking cases, where I see guns that are recovered in New York and they were bought here in South Carolina. And we worked from the beginning with the straw purchasers to try to build a collaborative group of cooperating defendants to testify against a bad guy from New York, hopefully a convicted felon, has caused him to purchase all these guns. So that being a beautiful, perfect ATF originated, initiated case, all of the good stuff happens prior to somebody being arrested, prior to Miranda, prior to any of the things that cause problems on, uh, for prosecution, because we're talking to people um, in non-custodial situations and locking in what their testimony is going to be at a trial way before we charge them. So those are the good ATF initiated cases and they're rare. The reality is adopted firearms cases. And I don't know a percentage of how many ATF cases are adopted, but it's a very large percentage. And they're kind of internally ATF management tries to get agents off of the adopted cases and work initiated cases. And in order to work something proactively, you're usually involved with drugs because 
you can go out and proactively buy drugs all day long. So if you're buying drugs from convicted felons that are carrying guns, it turns into an ATF case. And that's what ATF does proactively. But the reality is we're constantly in demand to take adopted gun cases from state and local police and from state prosecutor's offices because the state penalties for convicted felons in possession of firearms are minimum. Frequently, they are probationary. So police departments and sheriff's offices are begging ATF agents every day to take their adopted cases. So what's an adopted case do to the U.S. Attorney's Office? What they get is a North Charleston Police Department arrest, and they get post-custodial Miranda confessions that can be suppressed, thrown out, found to be not conducted correctly. So they're stuck with a state case at the U.S. Attorney's Office. But they're important cases because the guy's rap sheets are so bad it's worth the trouble. So right out here on Dorchester Road by the little purple barber shop down here, let's say North Charleston pulls a guy over. He's a multi-convicted felon. He's got three prior convictions for violent crimes or drug trafficking offenses. He's looking at 15 years minimum mandatory for possessing a gun. So what does the federal government have to do to prove this 922 G case that's got a 924 E 15 year minimum mandatory sentencing enhancement? They have to prove the guy is prohibited. He's a convicted felon. Well, that's pretty easy. That's where me, the armed paralegal, used to run around to courthouses and collect conviction documents and match them up to fingerprint records from those to prove through fingerprints that this is, in fact, the same guy that got convicted of these felonies. So that's his prohibited status. The second is that the firearm has to travel and affect interstate commerce to have arrived in the state of South Carolina. As trivial as that sounds, that was my expertise and that's what I did. I received a lot of training on how to testify to that so we don't have to subpoena people from Smith & Wesson every single day to come say that this firearm was manufactured in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, because when the Gun Control Act was passed, Congress had to figure out why the federal government had jurisdiction on these cases. And they used the Commerce Clause. They had to travel in interstate commerce, as opposed to the 1934 National Firearms Act, which is a tax law that deals with all the other NFA stuff that you are probably all familiar with. So what's the third thing we have to prove? Possession. That's the meat and potatoes of these adopted cases, is proving possession. If we have four guys in a car and one gun, U.S. Attorney's Office is in a bind. How do you prove that the bad guy possessed that gun? It all comes down to the circumstances of every single case. And sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's hard. But that's the reality of gun cases in federal court is there are state cases that are adopted, large volume of them. And they come and go as the political winds change. Right now, basically, uh, Attorney General Sessions within... I think last January, he sent a memo to the U.S. attorney saying we are going to prosecute all violations of the law. And that includes all of these gun cases. So the, the prosecution has been on an uptick. Uh, they've been getting more adopted cases done federally. But if any real gun case comes about, ATF is going to work on it from its origin. And we will try never to miss one of them. And like I said, we have all the advantages of being involved at the front end where we control all the things that we want to do, like get prior testimony, get corroborated testimony from other witnesses and build a case from that point. And then we're not speaking to the defendant or the client until he's already been indicted and arrested and we don't need anything. <laughs> We've already got our case finished. So what time is it now? It is 10 o'clock, Steve, <laughs> how's that? It's one minute. Did you guys have anything else you wanted to add on to that? Not unless there are any questions. Now, are you both going to be, so they both going to be back this afternoon for they're ethics? Back. That's what I was going to say. They're, they're all going to be back. Uh, me too will be back, and I think. Um, I'll be back later for bump socks and stuff. But what I was going to say is it's it's a shame you only got a few minutes of Miller Sheely because you could tell what a good speaker he is. So maybe you'll hear some more of him this afternoon. Oh, for sure. Yeah, uh, actually, that's, that's can, I, a, can I point out one thing? thing. Um, reference was made earlier to uh, taking your pictures with an iPhone, and it's just it's worth knowing that uh, with iPhones, you have the iCloud. And if you, uh, you take a picture with something, it gets uploaded to the iCloud. Uh, even though your phone as the attorney, maybe your, you know, your client file, the attorney client privilege and all that, not necessarily so with what's in the cloud. Uh, it's possible for the government to subpoena uh, that information. And That's another it. lecture, yeah. a <laughs> long lecture. That out. <laughs> but if you have a regular camera that's digital, really worried about that, take that, because it doesn't automatically upload to the cloud. You may lose a 
attorney-client privilege and maybe able to subpoena Google uh, and get your stuff. So they got my file. No, they didn't. It's in a third party's possession. That's uh, that, that usually doesn't come up these kind of cases, but it, it's it's another issue about how your files are stored. And you can't even run into ethical problems. This afternoon, we might mention that about how you're storing your files. Because in the old days, we all know it was in a filing cabinet. We knew it was in a room, and the government had to come in the room and get it. Well, now, if all that virtual stuff has been uploaded to Google, there are issues about whether that's properly secure, and the government might be able to get it, but not in a search warrant, but a subpoena. And you claim it's attorney-client. You just shared it with a third party. So there are real Fourth Amendment issues, attorney-client issues. about how, that's, that's not just the guns. That's files, period, if they automatically go into Google or some kind of cloud store. Any questions? Milk. Milk. <laughs> That's it. That's all. Miller and, and Henry will be back. They're going to do the ethics part um, at four fifteen. So it, it's actually the. Uh, it won't be Professor Merkel. It'll be who is your buddy yeah. over there at the college. But it will be actually Miller and Henry. Um, Henry's part of that might just be belly aching about other attorneys. I mean, he, said it was <laughs> he said it was professionalism, but anyway, and Mark, you'll be kind of around. So take advantage, catch these guys in the halls and, and take advantage of them while they're here. All right. Um, we're going to go, we'll move right into Hallbrook now. Of course, let's get this. I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to give this to you. Oh, oh yeah. Turn that off and I'll put it back Sure, on. sure. No, we're supposed to keep that here so they can hear Yeah, that's what we put yours. I want to get your uh that million that chair. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and you sent it to the um but anyway, let's get a little bit started. Can you tell that story? Yeah. Yeah, you tell it. Yeah, you tell it. And I'll have the picture by the time we Okay. Boy. Hold that. Is this going in my pocket? Or? Yeah, that'll go in your pocket, and this will be the. I wish there wasn't two of these, but. Uh, <laughs> Look at that! Every time you pull a one, it's like Christmas tree lights. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, exactly. All right, that's good. That's and then I put it just right here. Yeah, and you're already mic'd up, and then this one comes right here. Uh, and then you, I sent the check to. Tell you what, we'll, we'll get it. Why don't you just get started and I'll put it up during lunchtime. They'll be able to have a picture. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. Yeah, just tell the story. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I'm Steve Holbrook. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I was here last year and I can't get enough Charleston, so uh, thanks, Steve, for inviting me again. Um, I want to cover litigation activities that primarily are in the federal courts. You've got fairly uh, liberal laws in South Carolina about gun ownership, so you don't have a lot of the same kinds of issues that take place around the country in places like New York and New Jersey and California, uh, although you are in the Fourth Circuit, and that makes a big difference. And uh, so I don't forget, I want to uh, just recognize an old friend of mine, Herb Blanford. Herb, would you stand up and let them just see you? Herb is an NRA director, and he's, he's the past president of the, um, the South Carolina affiliate of the NRA. The South Is it South Carolina Rifle and Pistol Association? Gun owners of South Carolina, okay. Um, we, we had a number of associations, including South Carolina, that participated in some um, challenges to ATF regulations back in the late 80s, early 90s case called NRA versus Brady. Uh, the Firearms Owners Protection Act had enacted uh, various reforms to the Gun Control Act in 1986. And ATF did some regulations, some of which we thought were correct and some were stretching it a bit, so we challenged them and we ended up in Judge Blatt's courtroom here in Charleston. Uh, some of you might remember him, a crusty old federal judge who was a, a real a real judge's judge. I mean, uh, he didn't let anything go past his courtroom that wasn't proper. Um, and he held ATF accountable in some regulations and others he, he upheld. We went to the Fourth Circuit and th that court split the baby in half and we won some and ATF won some and we all lived happily ever after. So um, 
let's talk a little bit. Uh, you know, the challenges nowadays um, relate to the Second Amendment, proposed only of the Heller case from the U.S. Supreme Court. If you turn the clock back before 2008, uh, the federal courts had ruled the Second Amendment out of existence, by and large. Uh, the, the Johnson case out of the Fourth Circuit is a good example. Um, first of all, you had um, the wrong arguments being made by the wrong defense attorneys in criminal cases. Felon in possession, Second Amendment right? I don't think so. But what did the federal courts do? They said, well, nobody has a Second Amendment right. It doesn't exist. It's only a National Guard power of states. And, um, you know, what, what would have been the correct way of ruling in those cases? The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, that's an individual right. Um, but uh, felons waive that right when they get convicted of violent crimes or whatever they're convicted of. The, the law basically says you can't possess a firearm. And that would have been um, a more obviously more conservative approach that the courts could have taken. But instead, you had the invention of the collective rights doctrine of the Second Amendment, where the power of the uh, or the the um, right of the people to keep and bear arms really means the power of the state to maintain militias consistent with banning handguns or banning whatever guns you want to ban. Um, the Fourth Circuit did that in the Johnson case in the early 70s in about three sentences. You know, you get rid of a constitutional right in three sentences with no discussion. And that's, that was the state of the law before Heller. Finally, in District of Columbia versus Heller, Supreme Court, uh, opinion by Justice Scalia held that the Second Amendment means what it says. If you look at the text, the history and tradition of this right, it's always been interpreted as an individual right, really up until about the 1960s when when you had the Federal Gun Control Act being enacted and you had, um, um, like, we'll say anything we need to say to uphold any any provision of it. And as it turned out, uh, it, it had to do with, Mark Kelly just mentioned, the Interstate Commerce Clause was the one used to, um, uh, to enact it. And, um, you know, it was affecting felons and by and large, the individual citizen was left alone within their own states, with the exception of um, buying guns from a person in another state or transferring one in another state. That certainly had Second Amendment implications. If you have a, a granddaughter in, in North Carolina and you give a gun for a Christmas present, that's a federal felony. Um, but in any case, we had the uh, court in D.C. versus Heller saying that the District of Columbia cannot ban handguns based on the Second Amendment. And uh, that was really the only place in the country with handgun ban except for Chicago land. You had Chicago, uh, Cook County, some of the other Chicago um, area uh, localities that banned handguns. And so um, two different sets of cases ran off to the federal court in Chicago to file lawsuits the day after Heller was uh, decided challenging these various laws. And so you ended up, a number of those localities repealed those um, enactments knowing what the handwriting was on the wall, because then the issue became not whether the meaning of the Second Amendment that was decided in Heller, but it became, does the Second Amendment apply to the states? And um, up to this point, there were uh, states that, that said, not only can we ban guns or do whatever we want to do consistent with the Second Amendment because it's not even an individual right, but we can do that because it doesn't even apply to the states, even if it's an individual right. So you can do anything you want to do. The First Amendment's been held to apply to the states, not the Second Amendment. The Fourth Amendment does, you know, it's kind of pick and choose which right's important. Um, you might remember Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. You had the, the, um, superintendent of police going on international television really saying that uh, no, no citizens can have a gun, only police can have guns. And we challenged that in uh, um, NRA versus Mayor Ray Nagan, whose name uh, now is on the prison rolls, uh, all kinds of corruption charges later uh, that he got convicted of. I guess he's still there. And uh, we got the argument from the city of New Orleans saying the Second Amendment doesn't apply here. Uh, we ended up with um, actually a consent judgment, 
New Orleans said, well, we didn't seize any guns, but we'll give them back. Um, you know, typical lawyer talk, like um, whatever is the, you make an assertion and then you say the opposite of it. So, uh, you know, we never took any guns and uh, we never did that, but we're going to give them all back. So we created a, a program where you could go online and try to get your gun back. You know, it was pretty, uh, pretty sad. Most, so many people had left the area. Um, I saw a lot of the guns that had been seized and they weren't taken care of. They were all rusty. You had handguns and, and like 20 gallon drum barrels just piled in there and you had uh, long guns stacked up like cordwood. Uh, I don't think many people got them back. But in, in any case, um, going back to post Heller um, the, and Chicago land gun bans, you had all these lawsuits filed and we lost in the district court, we lost in the Seventh Circuit and went to the Supreme Court case called McDonald versus Chicago and Oak Park. And there we prevailed uh, an opinion, a plurality opinion by Justice Alito holding that under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, the Second Amendment is incorporated and thereby the uh, Chicago and Oak Park handgun bans were unconstitutional. And Justice Thomas, who made the vote uh, the fifth vote uh, would have proceeded under the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment, which has been rarely used in American jurisprudence. But anyway, that gave, gave us the five votes that we needed. And, and we did recover uh, over a million bucks in attorney's fees under, this is a 1983 uh, case. It's under 1988, you can get attorney's fees, and uh, that all went to uh, reimburse NRA for attorney's fees, and uh, we did um, uh, some further cases uh, against the District of Columbia uh, after the um, the Heller decision. Basically, the mayor of, the, of D.C. went on the steps of the Supreme Court and said, we're going to make life even more miserable for gun owners than ever before. So they enacted a lot of new restrictions like, you know, you always had to register every firearm in the District of Columbia. It was a, a crime not to register every firearm. So then they said, we're going to cancel registrations every three years and you got to re-register them or, or you become a criminal. And then they had a, another law that they passed that you can't register more than one handgun per month. And, and in, in D.C., um, parking back that South Carolina's old law that required you to buy one handgun a month, right? Um, and how many of you did that, by the way? <laughs> you, you had to buy a lot of handguns in those days, didn't you, before you repealed that law? Um, but we got both of those provisions invalidated in a case called Heller 3, and we got a, a million bucks attorney's fees under Section 1983 from the District of Columbia to reimburse NRA for supporting that litigation. Um, and I, I think Steve's going to have a photograph of uh, maybe at lunchtime of me presenting that check to Wayne LaPierre and Chris Cox of the NRA. Um, but anyway, uh, keep, keep that in mind. Um, when you're suing localities and uh, if there's violations of, of, of um, rights that are, uh, if there's some federal nexus to it, um, uh, or even if there's supplemental jurisdiction under a state law claim, you can get fees and you can do that even if it's in state court, as long as there's some federal connection to the, um, the lawsuit. Um, there, there was another case uh, the Supreme Court decided it was a big surprise. Justice Scalia had died. Uh, there was a Massachusetts woman who um, what, had been threatened with abuse and probably beaten some. And so she purchased a stun gun in violation of Massachusetts law and carried it uh, to protect herself. And she was caught with that stun gun. Um, and the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court upheld her conviction and said stun guns are not protected by the Second Amendment, we can ban them, because they weren't around in 1791. I mean, what do you think of that argument? Um, television and internet, they were not around in 1791 either, but the First Amendment still protects them. And, and in fact, in the Heller case in the Supreme Court, the court said that uh, modern communications are protected by the, uh, the First Amendment, they're the descendants, and by the same token are rifles, pistols, and, and shotguns, was not about other kinds of weapons, but the right to bear arms doesn't include only firearms. And so um, everybody thought, like Mark Twain said, um, 
what, what was that statement that um, the um, uh, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated? And so, since Scalia had died, there was only a four to four um, division in the Supreme Court of what was, um, uh, in terms of any Second Amendment case, you couldn't win a case. Uh, all of a sudden, the Supreme Court came out with a brief decision called Catano versus Massachusetts, saying that, wait a minute, we held in Heller that uh, arms that are commonly possessed by law abiding people for lawful purposes are protected by the Second Amendment. So Massachusetts, you need to reconsider what you held in this Catano case and think about maybe this woman should not be convicted of possession of a stun gun. Maybe that law is invalid. Um, so they remanded the case eight to zero. Uh, justices who had openly criticized Heller, who had dissented in Heller and then criticized it publicly, went along with this opinion, uh, Ginsburg included, for example. Um, Alito would have gone further, joined by Thomas, like, uh, you shouldn't even be remanded in this case. You should cut this, this abuse victim loose, and you should just say the stun guns are protected by the Second Amendment, the law is invalid. So the case got remanded, though, and, and um, Ms. Catano, um, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts didn't want to make a ruling with doing what the Supreme Court said in collusion with the DA who prosecuted that case, we'll just drop the charges in this case is moot. So we don't have to decide it. And to this very day, stun guns are still illegal in Massachusetts. Uh, but in, in any event, that was, a, that was a nice surprise to have the Supreme Court uh, make that ruling that was after, after Scalia's death and, and with a eight to zero vote. Um, now, what are the hot button issues nationwide on the Second Amendment? And, and once again, you don't have these problems in your state like right now so much, but you do have the fact that you're in the Fourth Circuit, and the Fourth Circuit is coming down pretty strongly on a variety of issues uh, in contravention of Second Amendment rights. So let's talk about modern sporting rifles, a.k.a. assault weapons, uh, one of the, the most successful pieces of political jargon ever invented. Uh, to derogate a constitutional right. Um, you can call them anything you want, and if you call them something evil, wicked, mean, and nasty, it makes it a lot easier to ban them. So that, that term assault weapon became in the national jargon like in 1989. It always applied to selective fire, um, what would be classified federally as machine guns before that date, and then all of a sudden or ordinary semi-automatic firearms became assault weapons. And nationwide, the, there's only a few states that ban what they call assault weapons, and therefore you get decisions upholding those bans decided by federal judges from those states. So the Ninth Circuit, California, most of those judges are considered of the so-called liberal bent. Um, Massachusetts, New Jersey, uh, the states that pass these laws, they're upheld by judges from those states. I mean, I did, I've done cases in New York and um, like the Firearms Owners Protection Act has a pass-through provision where it's legal to go from one state where a gun's legal to another state where it's legal passing through a state where it's illegal. They're not supposed to arrest you. And we litigated the fact that uh, if, you, if you're doing interstate transport of guns like that, and you go through LaGuardia Airport or JFK Airport in New York, they bust you. And, and when they do that, the police say, well, federal law doesn't apply here. This is New York. And when you go to this, the Second Circuit and argue the case, they, they can't conceive that, they, that the police cannot arrest somebody because somebody has a gun without New York papers. And you can't get New York papers and New York license unless you're a New York resident. So this law was passed to protect people like that. Um, but, but in any event, uh, so we've got the New York ass assault weapon ban, the, the, um, California, those have been litigated. Um, and here in the Fourth Circuit, since we have the um, problem that Maryland is part of the Fourth Circuit, if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be getting these cases in the Fourth Circuit because it's the only state in that circuit with the kind of anti-gun restrictions that you don't see in North and South Carolina, West Virginia, and Virginia. Um, 
So Maryland has their own definition of assault weapon. They banned it. There was a challenge called Colby versus Hogan. Uh, initially, the Fourth Circuit held that law unconstitutional, and um, it was written by a, a Clinton appointee. It was a very good decision. The case went in bonk, and the majority of the en banc court upheld the Maryland so-called assault weapon ban based on really weird arguments like, um, well, uh, an AR-15 is, is like an M-16. There's really not, not any difference to speak of in terms of full auto and semi-auto. A single pull of the trigger is, is more accurate than full auto. It's an even, even more dangerous than a machine gun. That's what the court said. And they call it the military weapon when no military force in the entire world issues sem mere semi-auto rifles as, as service weapons. Only you might have some district specialized use. So here, here they are, military-style weapons that no military uses that are more dangerous than machine guns, and therefore the law is, un is constitutional. And we don't care that the Supreme Court said if they're in common use, they're protected. We're going to invent a doctrine uh, and, uh, and apply the doctrine of intermediate scrutiny instead of strict scrutiny. And we're going to say that, well, when you do this balancing test that lost in the Supreme Court in Heller, that uh, these, these guns are really, really dangerous and we should ban them. And so here's what really gets me, if you know, I think probably everybody here knows a minimal amount of guns to know the differences as follows. Uh, so how do you define an assault weapon? How can you distinguish characteristics? Uh, legislatures that pass these laws know they can't just ban all semi-automatic rifles. So what, what can we do um, to, what can we say to uphold banning some of them so we can look like we've done something about shootings? Uh, can we, is it just because they're black? Can we ban them because they're black? Well, that's probably not going to work. But so what Maryland did was, um, I'm, I'm going to ignore the fact that a lot of them have a long list of guns and then they say, other stuff like that, you're supposed to know what that means. They use words like copies or duplicates, but what they're really saying is <laughs> we're banning these guns. We're also ba banning guns that are like them. You can't have the guns that are banned, so you're not going to be able to know whether something is a copy or duplicate of it. We're going to prosecute you anyway. Um, so let's ignore the, the listed guns, Colt's AR-15. Well, Maryland says Colt's AR-15 banned, but if it's an H-bar, it's not banned. Uh, but then they had a list of what are some generic characteristics. And for Maryland, it's quite different than some of the others. Um, for Maryland, folding stock, grenade launcher, or flare launcher, or flash suppressor. So if you have any two of those, then it's an assault weapon. But what you don't have is the conspicuously protruding pistol grip. And you don't have a telescoping um, stock. But then if you go to New York... Um, you, you do have the, the dreaded, conspicuously con protruded pistol grip. I mean, that is one, one really scary pistol grip. Uh, the fact that it, it's held in a little bit different way than a traditional stock, I mean, I have nightmares about that. It's coming to get you and come to take you away. So um, there you have completely different definitions, and, and, and you have different courts upholding these laws. So the Fourth Circuit said it's okay to have a law that bans the a folding stock gun um, if it also has a, a flare launcher. By the way, I thought a flare launcher would be something like boaters and others might have for safety purposes. Why would you want to ban a gun because it will launch a flare, which is not a weapon? Uh, but none of this really matters because the courts don't go into those issues. They the, All they talk about is shootings and the fact that some people get killed with these guns uh, and they ignore that most, hand, most deaths from guns are with handguns. The Supreme Court said you can't ban them, though, so they can't go there. Um, so there you have those characteristics, and that being upheld in um, a state uh, case called New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Cuomo. Um, and the, the court upheld that law under intermediate scrutiny. They don't talk about the characteristics of the gun, guns that make them bannable, uh, just the, they just keep using the word assault weapon over and over in every other sentence of the opinion. That's supposed to be persuasive. 
Uh, now, New York did one other thing that is really rather humorous. When they passed this ban, uh, this was in 2013, they banned magazines that held more than seven rounds. So I'm not sure how many guns you have that hold no more than seven rounds in a magazine, but standard magazines nowadays for, for handguns are, what, uh, 13, 14, 15, 17. Uh, standard magazines for a lot of semi-auto rifles are 20 rounds, maybe 30. Um, so most guns don't come with a seven round magazine or fewer. And I, I heard a rumor that the governor of New York called around to gun makers trying to say, well, how about making up some seven round magazines? And they told him where to go. Um, so New York came back when, when we were litigating this issue and said that we're going to change the law. You can have a 10 round magazine, but you can only put seven rounds in it. Okay, think about that. Uh, unless you're like at a silhouette, metallic silhouette match or some kind of match. But if you're keeping a gun at home for self-protection, um, you know, the most protected part of the, under the Heller case of what the Second Amendment guarantees of self-defense in the home, you can't put more than seven rounds in it. Um, that was too much even for New York courts. We did get that invalidated. And, and by the way, when they first set, said no magazines that hold more than seven, they didn't exempt law enforcement. So under the first version of that New York law, law enforcement couldn't have had a magazine holding more than seven, any more than anyone else. Um, so there you have the legislature going wild. Um, but the second, it was good enough for the Second Circuit, they upheld that. And then we come to a, yet another um, arbitrary definition of assault weapon. There was a case called uh, Highland Park from the Seventh Circuit that upheld a ban. Uh, of, that was an Illinois locality in the Chicago area, of Highland Park. Um, and they defined an assault weapon the opposite of New York. Okay, so you have a, if it's a rifle with a conspicuously protruding pistol grip, they won't ever tell you, by the way, any dimensions. Imagine if they defined a short barrel shotgun as one with a, a really, really short barrel, instead of telling you it's 18 inches, less than 18 inches. Um, what's conspicuously protruding pistol grip? Well, whatever. <laughs> that comes under whatever, doesn't it? I mean. Uh, we, we're just the legislature, and we're going to call something an assault weapon. We're going to give you characteristics that make it banned, but we're not going to really define what we're talking about. Uh, but the Highland Park ban uh, defined that as an assault weapon only if it had no shoulder stock. So here you have New York saying it's an evil, wicked, mean, and nasty assault weapon if it's got a shoulder stock and this pistol grip. And then Highland Park, Illinois, saying that Aha, uh -huh. it's only an assault weapon if it has no shoulder stock and the pistol grip. And so there you can see how arbitrary these, these bans are. Uh, that case, a uh, cert petition was filed in the U.S. Supreme Court and cert was denied. Justice Thomas, uh, joined by Justice Scalia, who, who was still alive, uh, that was the last year of his uh, life, <clears throat> filed a dissent from the denial of certiorari. Uh, and, and there it stands now. The Supreme Court has continued to deny cert. The Colby case out of Maryland, they denied cert um, it's two or three weeks ago. Uh, so the Supreme Court is not in a mood to hear any Second Amendment cases right now. And, and we're going to see that further in the next topic I'm going to mention, which, which would be the right to bear arms, uh, the entitlement of citizens to uh, have some legal way to carry a firearm for self-protection in public. Um, in South Carolina, and I think maybe 42 states now, we have shall issue concealed carry where you can get a permit. If you're a law-abiding citizen, there may be other um, like training requirements and things like that. But it, the, the permits are not limited to people who are really special people, like in New York City. I mean, Mayor Bloomberg and people like that get permits. If you're rich and famous and influential, you can get a permit. But if you're just a a common citizen, you're, you're like in a high crime neighborhood, uh, you're, you're in Harlem, you're poor, you're not going to get a permit, like get out of here. So uh, 
there's been challenges in the, the states, the minority of states that have may issue, like may issue if we want to issue laws for carrying handguns. And the um, <clears throat> case I'm going to focus on briefly will be uh, the Peruta case out of the Ninth Circuit. Um, California's law is said, basically says that localities like sheriffs will I issue permits if they think that uh, there's good reason for somebody to have one. So you have these law enforcement departments, uh, like the sheriff of um, San Diego, saying that uh, uh, we're not going to issue any permit to anybody unless we decide that they really need to carry a gun. And, you know, that might be recent threats as long as you reported them, and it might mean uh, that you carry big bucks around. Uh, but if you're just an ordinary citizen living in a high crime area, you don't qualify. you got to be really special. And so this Peruta case went to the Ninth Circuit, and the three-judge panel invalidated the San Diego's interpretation of California law under the Second Amendment. and said that um, under the Second Amendment, you've got to make permits available to all law-abiding people. And then it went in bonk in the Ninth Circuit, and uh, the, the court at that point said, well, um, get, get this. New York had not banned all forms of open carry at the time that litigation started, um, but concealed weapon permits were not being issued. You could carry like a pistol openly in some places as long as it was not loaded. Uh, as this litigation continued, that law was repealed and any kind of carry, any open carry was, in, was made illegal in California. And so the, the issue had been before that issuance of concealed weapon permits. And then the issue became the fact that California banned any kind of carry for law abiding citizens at large. And what the Ninth Circuit did in Bonk was to say, well, we're not going to consider the fact that California bans open carry, we're only going to say there's no Second Amendment right to conceal carry. And we're just going to ignore the elephant in the room that the, the posture of this case has changed. And so then Peruta um, and his co-plaintiffs co filed a cert petition. Uh, the Supreme Court denied that cert petition a few months back. Uh, and in that case, um, that, that was last year, um, this time, Scalia was gone, but Judge Gorsuch was in the court by then, and Thomas filed a dissent from the denial of certiorari, joined by Judge Gorsuch. And so he's come out pretty solidly in favor of Second Amendment rights in that case. Uh, so we still have the same posture of the court on that issue, being that he replaced Scalia. <clears throat> Well, the Fourth Circuit had, uh, yours truly, had done something earlier than, than that case. That there was a case called Massandero. I've got a lengthy discussion of it in the, um, in the, the um, handout. And in, I had my watch upside down. I thought it was like, I thought it was 11, but it's 1030, right? Something like that. Okay, so here this guy. Um, he's kind of dozing in a parking lot at a federal park that's um, in Virginia, but it's in a federal enclave. And um, an officer comes up to him and he says, well, you're really not supposed to be parked here right now. And by the way, do you have a gun? Uh, yes, sir. I've got a gun and a concealed weapon permit. Uh, okay, well, at that time, it was illegal to have a gun on federal property, on that kind of federal park property. And so uh, you're under arrest. You know, this is like what you get for being so honest and cooperative. I think the speaker, speakers before me were talking a little bit about, you know, keeping your mouth shut sometimes. Um, although, what do you say? Like, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> uh, does that make a, a probable cause that you do? Well, whatever. He got arrested. But then as this, court, this case worked its way up to the Fourth Circuit, uh, President Obama signed... Uh, a, a, a law about federal park land and I think maybe interior department um, topics repealing the federal ban. And so what a great case to keep prosecuting all the way to the Fourth Circuit, that it was no longer illegal. The guy had had a, a Virginia concealed weapon permit. 
he was had no criminal record, you know, what's the prosecutorial merit to continuing to use the resources of the United States to go after this? But they did it, and and they won in the Fourth Circuit. Uh, there's no right to bear arms outside the home. That's all Heller said. And if Heller meant something more than that, by golly, the Supreme Court's going to have to tell us. That that came out of the Maryland High Court at first, and it was repeated in the and by the Fourth Circuit in this Essendero case. I mean, if you look at read Heller closely, they talk about what bear arms means, and it's about carrying guns. Um, it's not confined to your home. Um, like how much? Uh, I mean, you the the right to self defense exists everywhere in the home and outside the home. Uh, Heller said that. The right to bear arms existed for other purposes as well, like for militia purposes. I mean, how how many times does the militia only have exercises in your home? And and hunting, the Supreme Court mentioned hunting. How much hunting do you do in your home? Um, <clears throat> a white-tailed deer, like, breaking down your door and they're coming inside. And then you got the laws about you can't shoot within a certain number of feet of an occupied dwelling. So... Uh, it's kind of an absurd argument, but it was basically defiant of the Supreme Court. And in fact, when when Heller was decided, um, Judge Harvey Wilkinson from the Fourth Circuit wrote a, a, a public article published in the public um, criticizing that and saying that it's judicial um, invention of a right. It's no, no better than Roe versus Wade. So here you have an explicit right mentioning bare arms in the Constitution, and you don't have the right to abortion. I, I've never found it in the Constitution. I mean, I'm not going to get in that debate, but it's like I, I never saw that anywhere in the four corners of the Constitution. And so you had the a fourth, sitting Fourth Circuit judge criticizing the Supreme Court's decision. Um, and he was on the panel that upheld this conviction in the Massandero case. And then the Fourth Circuit did another uh, decision upholding Maryland's may issue uh, carry law. Uh, we've got it cited in the material and that was the, the Woolard case. And so there you have um, yet another circuit upholding these bans. So again, fourth circuit, uh, third circuit, because New Jersey's there. Um, second circuit, that's where New York is. Uh, yeah. And then the ninth circuit where California is, you have those courts reflecting the laws in those states upholding these bans on carrying guns uh, by law-abiding citizens. Um, so it's most, most uh, circuits have made that holding now. Uh, but that's where things kind of get tricky. Uh, the District of Columbia, if you go back uh, to the Heller case, they thought, well, we're the government, we're going to win. So when the, the D.C. Circuit had invalidated the D.C. handgun ban, the district was, um, well, heck, we're going to go to the Supreme Court and get that overturned. And by the way, they were advised by the Brady Center and other anti-gun groups, don't take this case to the Supreme Court. From the perspective of proponents of the Second Amendment, it was a great case to go to the Supreme Court because it's a total ban of, like, one of the most popular kinds of firearms uh, that in every other, it's legal in every other state. It is so... Um, much of an outlier law that th those aren't the kind of cases you want the Supreme Court to decide. You want to get more commonplace laws that uh, you can go in and say, well, 48 states have this law. You're not going to overturn that, are you? Uh, I mean, it'd be hard to go do a, a challenge to the laws, the federal law and most state laws on short barrel shotguns. Um, so the, but the district was arrogant and they went ahead anyway. Um, <clears throat> but then when we litigated the Heller 3 case, uh, by, which was decided by the D.C. Court of Appeals, uh, the district decided not to take the provisions that it lost, like the one gun a month and the uh, cancel your registration every three years. They decided, don't, we're not going to take that to the Supreme Court. We're going to pay the attorney's fees and, and go on with our life. Uh, but then something more happened in the district that uh, they, had, they were a no-issue jurisdiction. You could not get any kind of permit, no matter who you were. Um, I mean, it, does, it goes without saying that imported people still had um, uh, armed security. Uh, you know, Senator Kennedy had a, a bodyguard carrying an Uzi when, uh, he, who got, like, uh, arrested for it. I don't think he got convicted because he was somebody 
protected somebody special. Um, but there was no handgun license available, whatever in the district, uh, license to carry. And so a, a case was brought there uh, called Wren versus District of Columbia. And it resulted in a panel decision in the DC circuit. Um, well, well, first of all, there was some litigation that the district had to issue licenses, had to have some kind of law. So it enacted discretionary issuance. Uh, and then there was a lawsuit filed saying that, well, you've got to issue licenses to all law-abiding people who otherwise qualify through training and whatnot. Uh, and, then that, and then that decision by the uh, two judges of the three-judge panel said, the District of Columbia's law is unconstitutional. And by the way, to give you just a, an inkling of the kind of arguments that are made um, to uphold laws like this, did you know that in, I think it was in 12, 13 or so in England, uh, the king had a law that regulated guns that could be carried? Um, that's probably good enough for today, isn't it? I mean, a law enacted by a monarchy, that should be the way you interpret the Second Amendment. This is history, after all. So those are the kind of arguments that are being made. And, and what this court did, the D.C. Circuit did in this Wren case, was to say, you know, what, what was going on in Chaucer's England is really not very significant in terms of the meaning of the Second Amendment. And the court went through our founding and the, uh, the original interpretation and all the state law, or rather state Supreme Court decisions in the antebellum period and thereafter that interpreted the right to bear arms to mean that law-abiding citizens had that right. And um, in the 19th century, Really, the only states that in the antebellum period that even restricted carrying uh, would, would have been the southern states who prohibited uh, concealed carry. Uh, and, and it was a universal rule. There was no law enforcement exception. If you were a constable or a sheriff or, or just a regular citizen, you could not carry concealed. You could carry open. That's what was thought to be the right. And then it was only in, in the, um, the 20th century. I mean... It was only in 1968 in New Jersey, one of the most anti-gun states nationwide, you could still carry openly. Uh, and so finally you had all the restrictions coming in in certain states and you had um, May issue in, in most states probably up until Florida enacted shall issue in the 80s and then it just has spread. And so we end up with um, finally in the District of Columbia, the D.C. Circuit saying that D.C. has to issue gun permits, carry permits to people who qualify, and you cannot restrict it to special people. Um, and, and so DC's thinking, well, gee whiz, I mean, we got a bloody nose already in, in the original Heller case, um, but they, the members of the DC council were saying, we really need to take this to the Supreme Court. This is, this is terrible, we, need, we, have, we should have home rule. And, um, and guess what happened? The, Attorney General, attorneys generals of states, the anti-gun states like California, New York, New Jersey, they told D.C., please don't take this case to the Supreme Court because this was a, the, the circuits were in conflict. The Supreme Court's chance of taking it were, was greatly increased, and they wanted to preserve their rulings in these states that, uh, where we had anti-Second Amendment rulings from the federal courts and if the Supreme Court gets a hold of it you know what they've done before which has not been good news for the anti-gun calls and so believe it or not the District of Columbia meekly decided not to seek certiorari and the District of Columbia every one of you in this classroom if you want to apply for a DC handgun carry permit you can apply and you can get it um, and before now in the old days what was typical uh, most of you might not even know. Most people who visit D.C. tourists, they don't even know that it's not like in other states where um, if you go to a government building and you want to go to the Smithsonian or something, museum, um, there, surely when you go to the security guard in the entrance, you can check your gun. Like, what do you think happened to people all these years when they did that? You were so busted. <laughs> um, and now you can actually carry the gun and, and there's restrictions on where you can take it. 
probably have to leave it in your car if you go to the Smithsonian Museum. Um, but otherwise, they're, they're now being issued. I mean, what, what a fantastic tale, the fact that here you have all these anti-gun politicians from other states telling D.C., please, oh, please don't take this case to the Supreme Court because we're afraid of what it might do in our jurisdictions. And so uh, that's where that stands, though. The, the Supreme Court, um, as I said, they, they re rejected Sir Sherwood in the Peruta case from the Ninth Circuit. And so that they're not in the mood right now to hear that issue. Let me mention a couple of cases that um, have to do with regulations. I've already talked about Heller 3, uh, the, <clears throat> the one gun a month rule and um, uh, canceling your registrations. Um, Jackson versus San Francisco, another Ninth Circuit case. Uh, you know, one of the rulings in Heller that's not well known, people don't talk about it, because the main thing was the uh, handgun ban. But it was another provision of D.C. law that was invalidated by the Supreme Court in Heller. And that was the ban on having a usable gun in the home. Uh, Pre-Heller, you could have a long gun in the home. It had to be registered. But it also had to be disassembled, unloaded, uh, and trigger locked. And so there was no exemption for use of a gun in self-defense. You could not assemble it and load it and defend yourself in your own home. That was invalidated. So that was the, the second part of Heller that got thrown out and is not well known because not many jurisdictions have laws like that. Leave it to San Francisco to enact a law that says that when you have a, a handgun in your home, it's either got to be in like a gun safe or, or locked up somehow, or it's got to be on your person. So you can't have a gun that's uh, in your home that's accessible at your nightstand uh, while you're taking a bath or sleeping. You'd have to have it on your person. So if you've got a waterproof gun, you could have it in, in your shower. Maybe that would work, but you had to have it on your person or it had to be locked away. And um, that got upheld by the Ninth Circuit. Uh, there was a, a cert petition filed. It was denied. <clears throat> And that was the, the other case uh, that Thomas and Scalia joined in, in uh, dissenting from the denial of cert. And Justice Thomas wrote a, just a beautiful opinion saying, you know, uh, the last paragraph of it, uh, here we are in the Supreme Court, we have these beautiful marble walls and all the protection we could possibly want. And we're just forgetting about ordinary people. You know, they, they don't have what we have and we need to take cognizant of the fact that um, here you have the court granting cert in so many other issues uh, and, and denying cert routinely in, on the Second Amendment, basically ignoring the right and um, not really saying it this way, but you know, we've invented so many constitutional rights that don't even exist in the Constitution and we, we decide those cases and we have a problem with a right that's explicit in the Constitution. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about um, statutory challenges and challenges to agency um, action. And um, are you all familiar with the divine right of deference handed down by absolute English monarchs? Uh, and the equivalent today is that if it's a dispute between a private citizen and a government agency, we defer to the government agency because they are the expert. And that's why it's a divine right. I mean, it's a carryover from those days. And um, it, it, it always gets litigated in every challenge to any, any kind of agency, it's EPA or ATF or whoever. And I've, I've litigated cases. I've, uh, I do a lot of ATF compliance work and I've, I've, I've known a lot of people at headquarters in ATF and worked a lot of stuff out. And a long time ago, when I was a young lawyer, there was an associate director there. They had a position called associate director. Mark, did you know that? Uh, they had the director and the associate director. We have a director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, there's always the actor, the acting director. <laughs> yep. Um, by the way, I, I had Sullivan, Mike Sullivan, I thought was the best director ever, and I always had hoped they would. Uh, confirm him, but they never did. 
Uh, but there was an acting director called Bill Drake, and uh, he told me, you know, we, we couldn't um, agree on some kind of importation issue. And he said, look, uh, he was an older guy, was a young lawyer, and he said, okay, we disagree. Like, sue us. I mean, that's what judges are for. It's not a problem. Um, and so I, I've done my share of that, and um, I, I had the good fortune to have a case called Thompson Center Arms versus the United States where we prevailed on a NFA technical issue in the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, but this deference doctrine, uh, if you uh, challenge ATF uh, action in a civil case, it, the deference doctrine does come up. And it's always, it's no different than it's, uh, if it's EPA or whoever. And, and so if, if um, the government says something and you say something, well, they're going to be deferred to. There's different degrees of it. This is an example. This is a case involving DOJ instead of uh, ATF. But after the uh, Brady Handgun Act was passed, um, at first, you might remember uh, starting in 93, 94 period, local sheriffs were supposed to do background checks. And that was like a f federal mandate that was challenged by Sheriff Jay Prince and others. Um, and I got to litigate those cases around the country all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, the Supreme Court said five to four, well, the feds can't tell states to administer federal laws. You can't do that. It's, it's uh, you got to tell, you know, the feds work for you. Why don't you tell them to do it? And so that got invalidated. But then the Brady two, the, the permanent provision of Brady correctly uh, said that the, the FBI will do background checks. Uh, or if states want to volunteer, they can do it. And so that was that idea. They call it the Brady Law, but that was the NRA's uh, language that went into that. That you have an instant background check based on this um, all this database under the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, and um, you you can have delayed um, checks, but they can be no longer than a certain number of days, and um, it's been a real problem getting states to report everything, especially on mental illness and th issues like that, but there's been fixes of it. Um, but in any case, when that first went into place in 1998, there's a provision of the, the act that says, uh, once you're cleared to purchase the gun, the only record that the NICS system can keep is the uh, transaction number and the date along with who the dealer is. That way you can go back and find the 4473. You can get all the information you want on the sale at a later date if you need to. You can also confirm that the next check was done. And so they said, you've got to destroy the record because we don't have a registration system in this country and we don't want one. It's prohibited by law, registration of gun owners and guns. And uh, that was when <clears throat> this went into effect. Janet Reno was the attorney general. She said, well, okay, for us... Um, destruction of the records, we're going to take six months to do that. And so that was a six-month registration period. And we challenged that in a case called NRA versus Reno. And the, the court, the D.C. Circuit, upheld that, saying that we're going to defer to the government. We're going to defer to the Justice Department's interpretation, and that even though it says destroy the, the record, um, they don't say when. That was an analogy we used, like, it appeared in the dissenting opinion by Judge Sintel in the, the D.C. Circuit. Um, so you're the parent. You've got the two, the, like the, the brother uh, pulling the hair of the sister or something like that. And you say, stop it. And he continues to do it. And, uh, the, you know, the mom says, well, I told you to stop it. And the kid says, you didn't say when. And so it was like, hey, you got to destroy the records, but you didn't say when. So we're going to just do it whenever we want to. Uh, but that decision led the Congress to step in and do the fix that you've got to, Nix has to destroy the records in 24 hours. And when I say the records, I, don't, I mean the record of the identity of the person, the address, all that information, the social security number, if it's, uh, if it's reported, things like that. And so, um, so we end up with a, a good Nix system in the sense of, um, what's required. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, but then we have problems like the shooting at the church in Texas, and uh, you had your own shooting here. 
but the one in Texas, the Air Force wasn't reporting criminal records to the NICS system. It's been on the, the books since um, 1994 or it's 93 is when the law passed. And then there was a more explicit law in the um, NICS Improvement Act from a few years ago about federal agencies. You like, we really mean it. You got to report these records. It wasn't reported. Um, so there's now the, the fixed NICS law that um, is before Congress. And also another piece of legislation, we just had hearings in the Judiciary Committee of the Senate uh, on the fixed NICS law combined with the so-called bump stock law that Senator Feinstein has introduced. And there you have, she wants to not just ban bump stocks, but also uh, any kind of device that enhances the rate of fire of a semi-automatic firearm, which could be like a better trigger uh, or some gunsmithing work that makes it where you can fire it a little bit faster. You go from a 10 pound trigger pull to a three pound trigger pull for target uh, work on a gun. And then that's a felony. All would be banned. There'd be no grandfathering, no amnesty. Um, if you have any of this stuff, you're going to be convicted. And then, and now you've got people saying that ATS got to redecide the issue of bump stocks. They said it wasn't a machine gun because of your, there's more than a, there's a single function of the trigger for every shot. And, uh, but ATF cannot create a new crime. I mean, they can do an interpretive regulation, which would probably be a good thing. Uh, but, yeah, you know, then there's going to be litigation on this. This different doctrine is going to come up on that too. And uh, I don't know where all that's headed, but uh, we live in an interesting time, to say the least, on our issue, don't we? Uh, and then the other thing that's come up in Congress is potential reform of the Gun Control Act, including possibly moving suppressors out of the NFA, keeping them only in the Gun Control Act. So felons can't have them. You've got to have a NICS check, and um, you, you've got a, a different attitude. Most states now have deregulated uh, suppressors. Um, most of us have hearing problems because it was never been part of our technology growing up. And I don't know about you, but I, I, we never used any ear protection until I was at least middle aged. So, um, what what'd you say, Sonny? I know. So turn your hearing aid back on, dude. Um, so I'm probably am up to my five minutes, Steve. Is okay. Um, well, no, if anybody has any complaints or anything or anything you want to say or ask, like we've got a couple of minutes, maybe. Um, yes, ma'am. I think it's a lot of people acting like, oh, well, Republicans are in you know, control of Congress and the White House and that'd be easy fix. But I, I've always thought it would be a long term thing to do. Uh, more and more states deregulate suppressors and make them legal for hunting, things like that. Uh, You've you got just too many movies. I mean, if you go back to the 1934 hearings when they first became in, came into the NFA, uh, nobody said they were used in crime. Uh, but, uh, you know, you've had so many movies where you don't hear anything of gunshots fired. And I just think there's going to be a lot of public education if, for this to pass if it ever does. So it's, you know, We'll see. But I think it's healthy we're having the discussion. Healthy in more ways than one. Anybody else? Uh, yes, sir, in the back. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be tough to get that overruled. California's going to require that you have, um, you can only buy ammo at a gun shop and then you have this check, a background check and uh, can't bring them in from out of state. If you bring them in from out of state, you have to have them shipped to a dealer and you got to pick them up from a dealer. Uh, New York tried to pass a law like that and we challenged that when we challenged their revised so-called assault weapon ban and came out of 2013. You have to buy, uh, like at an ABC store, you got in some states, you got to buy liquor. And I heard in South Carolina, a liquor store cannot sell anything unless it's got alcohol in it. They can't sell water unless it has 1% alcohol. So anyway, you got to buy ammo. 
that way. Uh, and But in New York, the system collapsed because they could not get the online system to work to go to the state police for every 22 cartridges that anybody wanted to buy. And so we'll see how it works out in California. But, but there's no, uh, there's jurisdictions like uh, San Francisco that ban hollow points. New Jersey has a reputation for banning hollow points, but they're not really banned in New Jersey. You can buy them at a store, you can have it at home at certain places, but there's other places you can't. So it's, they're restricted, uh, but not banned. Possession was so okay. Was it? yes, sir, over here. Yeah, I, I ran out of time. I wanted to, to mention that most states have, under the Nixon Improvement Act, have passed a way to get the disability removed where you're no longer prohibited, um, and also the Nixon Improvement Act. Uh, gave out a lot more funds for states to report mental commitments and things, that, stuff that should go in the next system. So there's a, more reports of, of mental commitments and, and adjudications. And by the same token, there's a way to get out of that. And there's a Sixth Circuit case in Bonk, um, Hillsdale Sheriff case that held that um, if your state doesn't enact any way that you can ever get out of this mental disability, uh, that there's a Second Amendment right that's involved. And this guy had, you know, 40 years before uh, his wife, like, fleeced him, you know, took all the money out of bank accounts, and he hit his head on the floor a few times. So he got a mental commitment. He could never get out of that for gun ownership. So uh, I've got the case discussed in the material here, Tyler versus Hillsdale. And then the other thing that's come up is there's a Third Circuit case, Bender Up, that held... Um, if you have a really unserious criminal conviction, there may be a way that you can have your rights um, as applied. Uh, you can file a Second Amendment challenge as applied to you uh, if it's considered a felony, but it's, it's something that hardly anybody in any state makes a felony. The Fourth Circuit kind of suggested you could do that in one case and then said you can't um, because of, uh, you know, the Fourth Circuit, again, we've got Maryland, if you were convicted of assault under the common law, which used to be the, the rule in Maryland, there's, you could get a life sentence. Nobody did. You know, you get a $50 fine and go home. So those are some looming issues. And by the way, in the, the Supreme Court denied cert in the Bender Up case of the Third Circuit, where you saying you can challenge if you have this, what's really a misdemeanor conviction. Uh, but uh, one big problem everywhere in every state is misdemeanor crime with domestic violence is a disabling offense. And um, you can only have rights restored if they were taken away, but nobody takes any rights away for that crime. And so you're, you're done for life. If you're a felon, you could be convicted of murder and get your rights restored and have a gun um, in, in some states. But for misdemeanors, you know, you're out of luck and no court has been willing to really look at that seriously. So. Um, so, okay, I know I'm out of time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have any questions? All right, I'll be around some. I'll be here, you know, past lunch, and feel free to come up and be glad to meet you. Thank you very much. And he does have his books in the back, by the way. Um, he'll sign them. Or uh, he does the practice series, too, on firearms law. I don't even know how he keeps this... Uh, updated but it's basically litigation checklist the whole everything um the next speaker i, I think we're going to take a break here the next speaker is actually craig jones he's an active dnr uh, law enforcement and um i'm actually thinking something has come up with law enforcement where he's got to be there so we're going to switch it a little and we'll put masada you next but if you want to take a 10 minute break or so lunchtime will be right around noon and then we'll Masao will go before and after lunch. But um, yeah, if you guys want to come up and set up. I was going to run off with your. <laughs> <laughs> we need that for him. He probably doesn't need it. Yeah, that was it. That was it. I need to talk to you. The thing you just talked about. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for coming. Thank you. 
Did you take the flash drive from me? Because okay. it took a few minutes to load it. I'll give Dutch for a girl with this. I will go have a cigarette. I'll be back. You want to bring me the flash? I'm to get out of here. I don't think I need it. Let me help you. Right. I'll catch up. Can we load this and give it a trial to see if it's going to work? Yes. I think you just put it right in there. In there? Mm -hmm. And then we'll put this. Let's see. We're going to put PC. Stop recording.